Excellent. So yeah, a diverse crowd. Obviously, people who work with content quite a bit. Perfect. Thank you. So, you know, as we know, there are you know at this point over a billion a billion websites. You know, each one of them uh, with with a uh, with uh, a goal, some sort of conversion goal, a, a user driven goal, some some purpose for being being on the web. Um, and uh, and as we know, a lot of these sites uh, that we encounter as agencies, as freelancers, whatever it might be, are redesigns. So with the redesign, there's constantly this, this, this question of, I have a site, you know, I built it, maybe spent some money, uh, but it's not performing in the way that I was hoping it would. It's not meeting those goals uh, that, uh, you know, that I set out in the original effort to, to achieve. So on that note, a lot of projects focus on visual design. Sort of how uh, how this how the aesthetics uh, of the site um, will sort of achieve the engagement, the user the user experience, and they also focus a lot on the on the UX. You know, potentially there's even focus on user testing, uh, focus on sort of uh, some form of uh, persona work. Um, but as we all know, content content space. is really where the data yeah. is at, right? So when you talk about with a billion websites that are out there right now, a majority of the time when we get a new client or we get a new project, it's not going to be some new website, unless you go to angel.co and it's this new idea. A lot of times we are all interacting with websites that have a redesigned project. With that comes one innate thing that I think a lot of us hear time and time again. It's, oh my gosh, my site's not performing. You get into things like lead gen, you get into things like conversions. You have to really focus on these efforts. If we ask ourselves as practitioners, really, what can we do to offer our clients that will help to actually drive meaningful results, meaningful solutions? Well, it's not really about the visual design. Um, can you do the next one? Absolutely. The visual design, I'm going to kind of give you guys a little bit of an analogy. A website's sort of like a house. So just like a house, it has an address that we can all go to and navigate and find. Um, just like a house, there are individual rooms, and every one of these rooms serves a very specific deal. You're not going to put a toilet in the middle of your living room, or you're going to put it in the middle of your, well, unless you're this guy. <laughs> but, uh, Nothing wrong so, with that per se. So much like a house, you know, you've got your paint on the walls, you know, you've got your tiling that's up. This is sort of analogous to kind of the visual component, right? When we come home from a hard day's work, at the end of the day, it's that really comfy couch that we all want to go home to. It's our bed. It's those comfy PJs and those really great slippers. Those things are like content. That stuff in your home is like content. That's the stuff that makes it a home, from that house to a home. So the idea of content-driven UX is sort of the same principle. It says visual design is really, really important but at the end of the day, that's really kind of the wraparound content, right? Content is the one that is the one thing that everybody, including everybody in here, when we go to a website, we don't go to a website to look at pretty pictures at all. We go to a website to achieve our own certain goals, our own tasks, to get answers to questions. Those answers to those questions, those things that will help you get to your task-oriented goal comes from content. So the principle of content-driven UX says, let's put content at the center. And if we're dealing with so many projects that are about web redesign, and we have to really kind of mitigate and figure out how we're gonna drive performance, how we're gonna bring in lead gen, how we're gonna achieve optimal conversions, how do we, how do we take a step back from our normal workflow, going into wireframing and all of that stuff, and how do we plug in that most important thing, which is content at the center of it? So the house is like a website, the stuff inside is like content. That's what makes it a home. Great. Thanks, Jean. Can you speak louder? They can't hear. How's that? Are we talking loud enough for the folks at the back? It's probably not here. Probably. Even higher? Okay, sure, perfect. So, like June said, nobody goes to a site to, to look at, at pretty pictures, and uh, uh, for brands to excel in this in this content sort of battleground, we need a scalable framework that's going to help us a kind of a lens, a way we can look at at a website or a web uh, page in order to ask ourselves the right set of questions to get us to the point where we're looking at content first rather than design first or UX first. 
So how many folks here, I'm going to ask some very obvious questions. Uh, how many folks here um, sort of do some form of uh, prototyping? Sort of, yeah, right, very common. That's awesome. How many folks here do some sort of user testing? Yeah, of course, naturally. So we're obviously making a lot of progress. So saw some sort of tentative hands going up there and a lot of, a lot of enthusiastic ones. We're making a lot of progress in terms of uh, web development, web design, in terms of um, taking the user into account, making sure the user is at the center of the efforts, making sure the user is a privileged, has a privileged position in the, the web development and web design um, workflow. But I think one of the challenges sometimes is stepping back even further and starting with content. Yeah. So content is, is sort of this requisite element that helps us shape those wireframes, shape those prototypes, and sort of come to the uh, UX and UI uh, phase, having already built something, scaffolded the content. Yeah. OK, so we wanted, I wanted to kind of share a work frame that, you know, work frames A need to really be adaptable and agile. We need to make sure that we have a work frame that can be as flexible and, you know, as needed so we can adjust it to different projects. So when I am working on a new project for a client, I usually engage into a work frame that's very similar to this. Um, this particular work frame comes out of a lot of different authorities within this space. Um, Christina Halverson, I'm sure a lot of the content people here um, know of her name. Um, and it also comes from a lot of different other places. I don't, for, for my own personal and the way that I go about a project, I really do need something that can scale. I might be on a small blog project or I might be on a huge university site where you're talking about multiple schools, multiple departments, courses and things like that. So I need to be able to scale something back. Um, this particular framework works really well for me and I'll kind of take you guys through it. The first one really is about audience. This is the most important thing, right? Because I'm an audience even though I'm the practitioner or the service provider, but I myself also go to websites, so I'm trying to achieve something else. It's really important for us as practitioners to really know, and I know that most of us, can you not hear me? Do you have a question? How do we do that? Do not think that I can. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Is this better? Okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. So the first one is audience. Um, for a lot of us that have practiced in UX, um, we all know that, that users are at the center of our world. It's so important in a content-driven framework as well. You have to know who your audience is so you know the kind of messages that you need to craft for your audience. You have to understand the kind of content that compels and moves them, that drives them further to commit to an action. So know your audience. It helps you to ideate on the best solutions when it comes to content and your delivery of that content. So the next one is messaging. Messaging is really important. Um, you know, it, messaging comes through voice, it comes through tone. A lot of times with my clients, I really try to encourage them to use an active voice. And then the brand personality comes out in the messaging as well. Do we have something that's really staunch and professional, you know, like maybe you would for a law firm? Or if you're servicing clients who may be college students, you may want to dial that back a little bit and want to have something a bit more approachable. So messaging is really important. You have to know your audience, then you gotta know how to communicate to them in the most effective way. This part right here really helps you to drive performance. You know, most of us and every one of you here in this room, we're all skinners and scammers, or scanners. Rarely do we ever, excuse me, <laughs> scammers. I so apologize for that. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, we're Skimmers and scanners, right. that means that we engage in scroll behaviors and we don't read line by line. We look for headings. We look for what's called front-loaded content. Front-loaded content means you give people the most important information up front because you know they're just going to scroll and they're just going to look for what they want. So messaging is really, really important. It also builds that brand relationship that you need. Um, when you talk about this... You, we mentioned earlier that content-driven UX is kind of the new paradigm or the emerging paradigm. 
you know, most of us have kind of heard this trend where you, you know, you build brand loyalty and get those logos out there and get that tagline out there. It's really not about that anymore. People have content loyalty. We all go to our favorite sites to go get content because we trust that. Part of that trust is born from the messaging. They've achieved the right voice, they've achieved the right tone, and they know how to chunk their content up appropriately and serve it right up to you as, as you being the target user. So the next one is interaction. So when I first started in this space, I started as a visual interaction designer. Visual interaction design says, how do I take content and what kind of UI do I wrap it around? If I have huge lists and huge paragraphs of text, I don't necessarily want to just lay it out on the page like a novel and hope that people have a really awesome time just sitting there for five minutes reading what I wrote. I might choose to break that up in maybe an accordion or I might choose to break that up into a tab, whatever. So the interaction piece is really important because this comes into content com consumption. What UI will help to get your target users to engage that content best. The next one is optimization. This one's a really careful one. Um, we work with a lot with um, SEO specialists, keyword specialists and things like that. Um, I am of the belief, and I certainly hope that folks here are too, that we must as content people write and serve up content that feeds the needs of users first and then text second. But it's important, this optimization piece is super important because you need tech to bring in that foot traffic. So as you're starting to craft your content and produce your content, it is really important and it is helpful, I found for myself as a practitioner, to really understand some of the best practices for optimization, to make sure that all this content that I'm writing for the human beings have an opportunity by search engines to be found and help me to make that marriage happen. So that's really important. The next one is distribution. So a lot of times when I'm talking to my clients at ImageX, we don't just talk and limit the subject to, okay, this is your content as it exists on the website. That's it. We need to help these clients understand that content needs to be served through many different avenues. Not every avenue is going to work the same. It will be up to you as that practitioner to really understand the nature of the project, where the audiences live outside of that website and that project that you're working on, and to make sure that you've created a bridge for your client to be able to distribute that content through a bunch of different arms. So like social media is a traditional one. Another one, Drupal.org. We've got so many things that we pump out through Drupal.org all the time. So distribution is key. Um, the assumption is you've got really important content, really important messages. At the end of that is a goal. And so distribution will help you. It's like many arms, like an octopus, to make sure that that goal is met. And the last one is measurement. So this is really important. This also speaks on a UCD type framework, so user-centered um, design. Measurement is really important. Um, I will never claim that I know off the bat the very best solution that will work for any of my clients. Um, part of being in this world means that you have the luxury of having so many other expert minds around you. And so for me, I can't go to a client and say, yep, this is the one all-in-one all solution and you'll get all the performance that you need. You'll get your lead gen, we'll start converting off the bat and all of a sudden you're going to be top dog in your space. That's not true. What, I, what measurement is, it's making sure that I arm myself, but I also arm the client, right? Because we want to make sure that our clients are also very responsible and engaged with their own website. So give them the best foundation to work off of, but make sure they have access, make sure that they have data, they know how to leverage that data, make sure that if you, know, you wanna to recommend to a client to use Google Analytics, that you're not just saying, look at the dashboard and make sure you monitor the numbers. You need to look at user pathways. All this measurement stuff will tell you as a practitioner, have you done your job? Have you helped the client achieve the performance that's needed? Are they actually moving forward to get to that goal? So this is, so the measure, measurement piece is really important. So this framework I kind of engage in almost every time 
um, I start a new project at ImageX. I want to know who my audience is. A lot of times you'll find that you've got a bunch of different audience members. I want to know what kind of brand voice, brand personality needs to come through in the messaging that compels those users. Then I want to know what kind of UI I need to wrap this content around so they can digest it the best without overwhelming them. Then making sure that you meet the needs of the tech side in the back so you can actually get that foot traffic right into the door. And then distribution. Don't limit yourself just to, to the website that you're working on. Make sure that you're mindful of all the properties that are in existence within that particular ecosystem for that project you're working on. And then the last one is measurement. Again, one of the most critical pieces. You know, we talk about iteration and we talk about refinement and polishing and getting better. Rather than taking wild guesses, content is one of those things, just like with design, where you need to have measurements, you need to have data, you need to arm yourself with that, because that's going to be the best way to inform you in what direction you need to go next. Thanks, Jim. That's, a, that's such a great sort of... Uh, framework for you know, the, sort of the high level things that you need to consider in a, in a content project, in a web design, redesign project. But of course, you know, as with every framework, it's like when you, you, know, when you go to the hair dresser and you get your hair cut and then you go home and you're like, well, how do I get it to look like that again? At least I have trouble. I don't know if you do. <laughs> for me, it's actually you know, not so hard, but maybe for others. Um, so with that in mind, knowing that this is a framework, this is kind of a high level um, lens that we can see that can view a content project through. A kind of a derivative or a child of that framework is uh, this, these criteria, uh, which kind of help us to sort of ask some, you know, some key questions that guide us through how do we approach a given page, a given section, a given site. Can, now at the back, can you, can you folks read that subtext? Not too much. I will tell you all about it, don't worry. <laughs> can you read the headlines at least? Excellent. Okay, that's that's the main thing. So this is the these are the content-driven criteria which emerge from the framework that, that that June just talked about. The first one is message quality. Does the content personality match the target user? Uh, do you know what is working with and what's not? So something like a content audit can really sort of help. I assume I'll probably knowing what we've seen from the audience when we ask the first question, "Who are you?" I assume how many people here have done some form of content audit. Okay, so about half. One of the most important pieces in a content-driven right. UX framework is that audit. That's your best weapon. Yeah, and I don't want to get too sidetracked about audits, but what kinds of things do you put in audits? Do you put sort of content quality scores, um, sort of some form of relevancy? Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, so I see some nods, some some non-nods. So we'll walk through an example of one of the content audits that we've used. Um, we won't go into huge detail about yeah. it, but we'll show you a snapshot of it. So that's message quality. Does the content personality match the target user? Is this the right content for that user in that position in their journey? Um, front loading. So June kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, so is the most important content served up front, kind of the you know, reverse pyramid in, in the, the world of journalism? Do we, have we, I, I guess there was a, a great um, sort of copywriter who said, the goal of the headline is to get you to read the first sentence. The goal of the first sentence is to get you to read the second sentence. So front-loading content is really critical. We have such a short time frame to get people uh, engaged. The third one is chunking. Our headlines, lists of UI patterns uh, use well. So have we arranged the content in a page in a way that's engaging, in a way that sort of uh, brings people to the next sort of step, in a way that's readable and, and, and uh, supports the scanning behavior we know from that all users employ, or virtually all users. Uh, UI patterns, are the best UIs leveraged to help users engage and digest content? And June kind of talked about that a little bit earlier. Like how do we actually arrange the page itself or the interface, maybe page is too old in a term, interface, uh, in order to sort of facilitate that user, user journey? And then finally, I guess, you know, pathways. It's kind of such an easy to neglect sort of thing in, in, a, in a content initiative. I mean, how many times you go to a website and you you know, read this great page, all this great content, you're like, what's next? There's no sort of next plausible step to kind of get, take it to the next point in, in what you know to be the user journey. So does the content provide users access to complete goals and tasks? And then finally, this will be a bit of an eye test for me too. Access. Is the content easily available across multiple devices? 
and platforms, as and June, you, you kind of alluded to that, and this is kind of the, the tactical step of how you might look at a page with that question in mind. Great. Okay, so you don't have to memorize this. I believe the slides get up to, uploaded to Drupal, the Drupal site, um, and uh, we'll also come back to the slide a couple times during the presentation. So we've got a, a framework, we've got criteria. How's my voice, by the way? Okay? All right, I'm getting the thumbs up, great. Now, we want to um, to kind of walk through maybe the slightly the next level of detail of kind of you know how, how we might approach um, a project, what kind of deliverables might we employ, um, starting with the scariest one, of course, the content audit. I've actually literally had clients tell me, I don't want to look at spreadsheets, don't tell me a spreadsheet. So I said, there's a content audit happening, and I would sort of draw it out for them. Um, so this is a, an example of a, of a content audit. And June, you actually did uh, create this content audit. You want to speak a little bit about it? Sure. <clears throat> so I mentioned earlier that your, the content audit is one of the most pivotal things to kind of launch off to this framework. It's, it's hugely important, especially, you know, earlier we mentioned that there's over a billion websites. And, you know, lo and behold, you will likely do a redesign project. Um, you... More often than not, I hardly ever come across clients that ever say, we are not going to use one thing from our existing website and put it into the new one. There is always going to be something that will come into the new environment. So part of the, the content audit says, you know, we want to make the best decisions for our client. We want to do the best work that we can for this new environment that's about to go to the world. So a content audit is an assessment on the current health of the site. It gets you face to face with so many different facets. A content audit, I do a, a, a ton of different ones. Some of them are really lightweight. Some of them are SEO audits. Some of them are hybrid. So I will go and deploy a few different tools on a website. And then while those tools are crawling these pages, I go into manual audit mode and I actually sit there face to face and I'm looking for very specific things so I can ultimately score almost every single page. Now, some pages, some sites, and I'm sure you know, many of us have been a part of them, I've, I've worked on web projects where there are thousands and thousands and thousands of web pages. So how do you, you know, be mindful of budget and time? You focus on what I like to call mission critical pages. So if you, if you know the business goals, um, go into those, those pages that are most important. Service pages are, product pages are, about pages are just as important. Um, but I go through and every time, it kind of depends on what the actual scope of the project is, but my attributes will change from project to project. Now, when I do a content audit, there are usual suspects that folks can see across any of my audit deliverables. Um, at the end of, what I usually go look for is, is how, the, how the site is performing on the front side of things. So user engagement, when I can just go on there and look at it. How's the quality of the images? How's the voice and the tone on there? And then I also audit the back end of things because I want to make sure, again, it's that engine stuff, right? All of our work hinges on two very important audiences. It's the physical beings and then it's the mechanical ones. So I need to make sure that before we start tearing a site down that I'm not going to tear something down or redo something that already works well. Maybe there's some room for me to kind of refine it and make it a little bit better, but I don't want to disrupt something that's already meeting performance. I want to find the stuff that's not meeting performance, but I also want to make sure that if I've got something that's performing really well here, the pathway to get there could be broken somewhere. So I want to make sure that that pathway is, is, is healthy and viable too. So the other part of the content audit, usually when I'm doing an audit, I always dive into its best friend in my opinion, which is some sort of analytics platform. So I will usually have like GA open, for example, and I dive in a little bit deeper. So this is kind of the superficial one just to show you guys we're talking about Google Analytics right here. When I'm working on a client site, I usually go in and I, I need to know what the click pathways are that their users are taking right now. My time frames will be a little bit different client to client. I may benchmark something about a month and just kind of see how user flows are happening. It'll help me to identify 
any gaps, any broken holes that need to be fixed, but I also pair it with the content audit and all the findings from there. So when I mentioned the content audit having a lot of the technical stuff, are they doing meta tags? Are they you know, optimizing appropriately in the back end? You know, simple things even like not having a tag on your image, you're losing juice right there. So I just make sure that every time I do a content audit, that I have Google Analytics open at the same time and I'm really getting face to face with this website before I do anything at all. And it makes me more informed as that service provider, right? I can speak on my client's website. I know it inside in and out. We can go back as a team and we can really start to ideate on solutions from a more meaningful platform without having to play any kind of guest games whatsoever. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Jim. And that, that's such a great point about analytics and such a natural step after you've, you've gathered some actual knowledge about where is your, your content at, what kind, of, what kind of quality issues are there, what kind of blockages are there for users, what kind of um, you know, effort is involved in this content, this content redevelopment effort. I like Google Analytics, I think it's a great tool, it's a great visualization tool, it's a, it's a great stakeholder reporting tool, it's, it's got a lot of, a lot of value. Um, I also like to combine it with other tools like has anyone here used any sort of voice to customer tools like, you know, well, call or various, various things? Yeah. I think those two things together in particular would be a very, very powerful way of triangulating qualitative and quantitative data to really get, to really get the, move the needle, get the stakeholders kind of motivated. I find the combination of the statistics that they see from Google Analytics and the actual words from the users make a huge difference in kind of, you know, giving you some ideas on, how, on what's going wrong uh, and also catalyzing your how many people have bosses? Anyone in the room? Okay, a couple, right, right. Catalyzing sort of upper level stakeholders to, to do something, to make a move, um, and, to, and to prioritize content as well. You can get a project going, prioritizing content is another, another challenge. Sure. Right, and the, so the content audit piece, I just, one last thing about that. So it is so important, you know, when you guys go in, I'm sure each one of you guys do a different sort of content audit for, for your clients. I would, if you're not doing it now, I would stress to go and consider start, you know, if you're doing it, you're probably likely doing it in a spreadsheet just like I am. Um, but make sure that you give yourself some columns so you can actually do some quality scoring. Um, it'll help you to really quickly, like for our clients that we do, I let them know right up front, is this, is this content good? Now this is under the assumption that I am face to face and I know inside and out what their requirements are. I already know who those users are, I know what their brand is, and I know what kind of personality that brand should be in the digital space. So after I've gone through and I've audited all kinds of stuff, I go back through and I start doing a series of quality scoring. So does this content actually meet this particular need? Is the brand personality actually being projected? Does it really meet the marketing department and all that great work that they've been doing? Um, and then, you know, part of the technical stuff goes in here too. So some of those optimization things. So I provide my clients with a few scores on um, quality. So accuracy and relevancy. Yeah, I mean, time and again, you come across client websites that have typos like crazy. You know, those things, like, those things really do kind of add up. There's other kinds of accuracy, right? Um, sure. Question here. So you have accuracy and relevance in the same column. Yes. Right, so some of them I will actually split up. So it kind of depends on the project and the scope itself. So for this particular one, it's they wanted to make sure that they had their key messages. Was it relevant to the culture today and the culture that was needed for their target audience, which was you know teenagers graduating from school? So is the message relevant to this particular target audience and that demographic, and is it accurate? Um, it, are, are we actually building out messages that are appropriate for 16 and 18 year olds versus an adult who wants to go back in, you know? So it, it depends. I've certainly had audits where I split them out. And that's a beautiful thing is, is there's no, you know, there's no Bible that says it has to be this way. You know, you guys as the experts and, and the practitioners have got to make sure that you arm yourself to be able to break this type of data up so it works for you because you're the one that has to deliver to that client. 
So yeah, you can break it up. This one I can I put it together. And then content quality. So some of the attributes that kind of go, or some of the things that I think about that go into content quality, you know, is it front loaded? So Bjorn had mentioned it's, you know, th the whole idea when we were in high school is okay, you write an essay and you come up with a great headline and then you lead to this awesome killer conclusion at the end. Web users don't want that. We all don't want that. We want to know what the meat is up front. And because we're skimmers and scanners, <laughs> um, headlines are really important. That adds into content quality. You've got people who are just scrolling, and we all, you know, we've got these one-page full scroll sites now. I mean, you know, it's like it takes half your life to get through some of them. It's unreal. So things like headlines are so important. It seems like such a, a, a minuscule little thing, but it helps. In those headlines, what you want to do is, is a content person, or for me as a digital strategist, if, if I'm mindful that my users are scrolling through a site, I want to tell them a story right through the headlines, right there. Right? I want to start building that right there. And then even with the sub headlines, everything's just got to make sense. It's got to be that on-page story. So, you know, a, a bunch of different attributes go into content quality. So front loading, you know, I look for things like that. I look to see if the content is actually chunked appropriately. I look for simple things like grammar. Are they actually leveraging, you know, an accurate brand voice and tone? Are they speaking in an active tone versus something that's a little bit passive? You know, something like that is so important, especially when you're dealing with like a brochure site. You know, you've got a company that has this really great big platform and they use their website as a portal and a means to get new business. So as a prospect, you know, the confidence comes from an active voice. I am great. This is me. This is what we can we do. Not that here. passive one. Over, over here. There yes. Being that Drupal is a content management system and often we create sites that we hand off to people to destroy by filling them. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Is this process an education process? Are you trying to teach your client how best to use the site that you're giving them? When they're putting their, when they're tweaking their content, making sure and, and moving forward, after you've stepped away from the site. So this, with the content audit and the framework, it, it's more for me as the practitioner. Um, if if I am looked upon to provide a solution for a website, and then I have to step back and go guide all these teams to go make it happen. I want to make sure that I am coming from a place where I don't spend a majority of my time in the guessing game world, that I have been up front with the site, that I have actual data, that I actually know the quality of the existing content before I make any decisions. Now for a lot of times, because I do believe in empowering clients, you know, I've been in your boat too where you get clients that are just, you deliver something beautiful and all of a sudden, you know, you give it a month and it's something totally different. So. I, any of my deliverables, I try to make sure that I give it to them in a workable kind of platform. I'll hand them over a Google Doc and say, this is, you know, it is unsexy, it's scary for most clients, but this is a tool that will really help them to make sure that, you know, any content that we end up mi migrating to a brand new site, they can still have the opportunity to know what's failing, what's not working, maybe we have an issue with time and budget and we can't get through all of this and help clean it up, but I want to make sure that I provide clients with a venue or somewhere to go so they have the opportunity to continue that cleanup and continue polishing it up even thereafter. It's always about putting the best solutions out there for your client, but I also believe as a practitioner, sorry? Okay, great. Lost phone. Lost phone anyway. Um, but part of, you know, part of being the expert, part of being this, or the subject matter expert, part of being that, you know, that expert that, that service provides a bunch of different clients is really empowering them, making sure that they get to a place that they can continue this work for themselves. Otherwise, you know, you're going to get an upset client, you know, maybe you're managing their site later on, you're going to get an upset client who has no idea what's going on. So even with the content audit, it's a wonderful tool. 
um, that you can pass on to your clients to help prevent that type of a situation, but it's more for me as a practitioner um, to make sure that whatever solution I come up with is the most informed, validated, and data-driven, that I don't spend a lot of time in the guessing game world. Th Thanks, Ian. Yes, Definitely. yes, yes. So I usually, what I end up doing is after a content audit, after I've performed a content audit, I'll have you know my delivery meeting with a client. A lot of times I ask for them to invite any producers, any creators, um, anybody on their team. It doesn't matter if it comes from multiple departments. Anybody that touches content on their website, I try to get them into the delivery. Because these are first the folks that have probably created the initial content, so they should know that they're putting out things that probably could be a little bit better. But they should know how they can also do things better, right? So in here, they'll end up seeing some recommendations. You won't see it on this, obviously, it's a screenshot. But a lot of times I'll even put in recommendations on there. Um, so I do try to involve as many of the players as I can. It makes it better. Kill two birds with one stone sort of thing. But not necessarily in the creation of this. No, no, no. So this, oftentimes, this is a solo effort. Um, if you have a big content team, you can break the audit into, if you're doing a hybrid, which is um, one that I traditionally do. So I'll deploy tools, and then I go in and do an audit one, or a manual one, excuse me. So when you have a big content team, you can, you can kind of compartmentalize pages and say, okay, team A, you're gonna focus on this, team B, you're gonna focus on these pages, and then you guys come together and then put that entire audit together. But generally, doing a content audit is usually left up to one person or two people. I've traditionally found in agencies, it's a content strategist that does it, um, or a content producer um, that ends up doing an audit. Great. Thanks, June. So lots of questions about audits. That's a great subject. We could obviously clearly spend the whole time talk, talking audits, I think, quite productively. Um, my mic's a lot louder. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we talked about sort of what an audit is, got into that in a good amount of depth. We talked about sort of what might happen after that in terms of looking at the actual analytics of the site itself, where user pathway is breaking down, what content is performing well and what's not, how we can validate that audit. And then the next sort of step uh, in this framework typically is the temptation and probably the dominant workflow in many web projects is to get into um, some form of sketching or ideation of the interface as soon as possible. And there's nothing, ro nothing wrong with doing that. Even, even when you're on a, maybe a project on site, uh, whether you're a your client or you are the person creating that site, starting to think about how users are going to encounter that, that interface is very sensible and a thing you can start doing right away. But it's very helpful and very productive and you get great ROI. From stepping back and thinking about, okay, how are we gonna architect the content before we, put, we create rectangles? So no rectangles yet, um, maybe a square or circle potentially. Uh, but uh, we highly, uh, have, we found tremendous value in the kind of getting the content sh chunked and shaped in a state of um, strong architecture before uh, even thinking about how it's going to look on the page. Yeah, so content architecture, um, it, it's, it's pretty much, you know, what's that content going to look like on page? Before you, as Bjorn mentioned, I think, you know, I even come from this, from this realm, you go right into wireframing right away. You know, and you've got your placeholders here, there, and everywhere else in between. Um, if we dial it back to the beginning of this presentation, we look at how many websites are out there and that a majority of them really are focused on lead gen and they're focused on, you know, conversions and all this other stuff that's performance at the end of the day. Um, what we do at ImageX is we say, okay, be hold on, before we start expending a bunch of time wireframing, let's really take something so simple as a Google Doc and really start architecting this content. Generally, when you've kind of been in your field for a while, you can kind of visualize in your head how things may end up go. Thank you, Brent Wilker. Thanks, Brent. Uh, we may, you know, you can kind of visualize what the page may end up looking like. But this says that you are going to put content at the center. 
So what I end up doing is, okay, if I've talked with a client, I know that, let's say, for example, their homepage, oh, they want to have some product features or some services features on their homepage. They want to highlight some of their sponsors. They want to highlight this, that, and the other. So I kind of start to break things down right in Google Drive into different little boxes. Um, and I put in very specific things like, okay, if I know that I need to have a product feature saying, well, what sort of subtext am I going to start writing about that will actually get people to start digesting this? And then we talked earlier about those pathways, right? So if you have a product feature on a homepage, you want them to actually dig in a little bit deeper in that site. Maybe go to that products page and they can start seeing a little bit more content like tech specs or something. So I just start breaking things down right on page and it's a total copy kind of activity for me. I start writing out headlines. I start thinking about you know the whole chunking thing and the front loading thing. Um, and then what I do is I kind of zoom out on my document. And, and usually what I do is I look at my headings and I'll kind of scroll through. Are my headings communicating a story from top to bottom? Or are they just kind of random? That stuff is really important. The other thing, you know, if, if you have, um, at ImageX we have a really great tool, it's called Axure. We end up working through that too. So content architecture can happen through whatever medium makes you guys most happy. But it is one that says you are going to focus on content first and you understand that the visual design is what wraps around that content. Focus on the brain and the meat first that drives that performance and then worry about you know, the wallpaper you're gonna throw up later. So you know, like I said, we use kind of Axure, so Axure is really nice. A lot of times, you know, once you start from this kind of base, then what we'll do is we'll go to the design team and say, okay, now it's time to wireframe. Oh, and by the way, here's some killer copy that you can drop right into your wireframe. So a lot of times when we produce something for our clients, we try so hard to stay away from lorem ipsum text. Again, it's clients, they're worried about lead gen and they're worried about performance. How you can't expect to have a conversation with your client about these very important things when they're just sitting there staring at lorem ipsum text or a button that says button. You know, language is so important. It, it compels us, it moves us. And it's really important to make sure that you provide your clients those opportunities at the onset. So if you get content architecture in before you actually start wireframing, it helps you to do that. Then you can just pass it off to the design team and they can start dropping in. Now if you've got a tool like Axure, uh, you know, what we do is we have our teams work in one file in real time. So they wireframe, we've got our design team that ends up wireframing something, and then we've got our content team that goes in, and they, you know, a lot of times, even when you start here, it doesn't mean you have it perfect at the, at, at the onset. There's still gonna be refinements, there's still gonna be iterations, right? So they can work in tandem through that kind of program and they can start working together and we still have one great solution to provide a client at the onset. It's not just, oh, here's a wireframe for you. It's, here's a wireframe, here's some of the text that's starting to come out, here's some of the content that's starting to come out. And it's not that we think that a carousel is really, really fun, but it actually chunks up this content in a way that will really help you meet your goal. Yeah, that's, that's such a great point, at June. And, and I mean, so much of this too is beneficial to more than just the process of collaboration and coming up with dynamic, great content that serves the user need. For the PMs in the room, I think I saw a few of you. It, this is also a risk mitigation tool that helps you kind of um, start thinking about content early, start planning for content early. So when you, when you actually have a site um, launch or when you're ready to start some form of uh, testing, you know, your site is in a much more complete state. You've thought about this in an, in an early stage and you're really just starting, starting to get ready to um, um, get your site uh, in shape for, for launch. So all of this effort, you know, so at some point this happens, right? I assume uh, at some point an interface is created, potentially on paper or, or um, in, in, in actual, however that might happen. Um, but our experience has been that deferring that can be valuable. It can be valuable to do it at the beginning as well. Maybe you do something pro prototypical. This is very cheap in every sense uh, to create something simple like a five minute sketch. But then to validate that sketch with the actual content uh, is really the sort of the key. So lots of talking from us. Um, hopefully relatively interesting talking. Um, now we're going to move into a couple of quick activities. We've got about 13 minutes, but I think we can do this. Yeah. So um, anyone here from drupal.org? Okay, don't tell them. 
we're, we're going to uh, we're going to just walk through um, one of the pages on, on Drupal.org just as an example, just a, just a way of thinking about how can we take this framework, these criteria, and apply them to a real world example. Again, to give you a bit of an image or a takeaway um, from, from what's been talked about so far. And we're not going to, you know, the site is a, is a good site. We just thought it's, uh, it's one everybody knows. All right. Everyone has an opinion about web, websites, right? Yeah. OK, there we go. Good. OK. Here we go. And can everybody see that at the back? Can everyone see that? Yeah, OK, I'll blow it up just a little more, maybe. There we go. Cool. So this is Drupal.org. Um, it, is, it is a level one link there, Get Started. So this page right here, if let's say you're doing a CMS migration or you're deciding to scale up from D8, D7 to D8 or what, whatever, the assumption is you'll go to this site to get started. The assumption is probably that you're likely new to the Drupal scene and you want to get some information about what this CMS can do. So we, take, we thought this would be a great kind of page to take this concept of content-driven UX and kind of look at this. So at the, we'll start with this page and then we're going to flip it back to the audience and I'm going to look to you guys to kind of just give me some of your feedback. Um, so on Drupal.org, you have, I'll wait till, there we go. So on Drupal.org, you have four steps. There are four steps before you can get this darn thing, right? Now, under these four steps is a whole bunch of stuff, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, so when I first looked at this site, I had no idea about the four steps. And it actually took me a while to realize that every one of these things listed under are the actual content that's associated per step. I didn't realize that. I looked at, I didn't even see the top part at all. So I just sat here and I looked, oh my goodness, there are 50 million links going on, right, blue. And then there's two buttons, find a distribution. I have no idea what that means. Um, I had no idea that this was, this was intended to be a UI that's a pathway for me. I had no idea that this was a UI that was intended to take me from point one or A all the way to point Z, and boom, I get to have something awesome to work from. I had no idea. So content-driven UX would say, okay, there's a lot going on here. We've got a lot of clickable area. It is hard for anybody, I'm assuming even you guys probably looking at this, that there's four steps to get through with a million links underneath. What I would do for this particular one is go in and assess all the, co the copy itself, is it actually saying what it needs to say in a get started page? And then is the UI even appropriate for this content to be engaged by a user? In my opinion, perhaps we could do it a little bit better. Something so simple as even just a tab or an accordion or something like that, right? Those little UI elements are so important because it's this thing, it's called micro experiences. If you've got a tab situation, or if you've got a step situation here, you really want to kind of provide them a micro experience. And maybe you can do that through like an accordion. You get them to focus on just the step one and the content here. And here's the one thing you need to do to complete step one before you go to step two. That's it. That's it. And then in the next micro experience, then you focus on the extended Drupal, right? So if this was my client, I would ask him, What's the most important here? How many times are people actually clicking on these links? Where, where are the clicks actually going? What questions are actually being asked by those clients? You know, and you start to help your client break it down a little bit. And then you just go through each one. But you can play with different UIs in this situation to see how they present. But then you would go back to that measurement, get your data, and you can kind of benchmark and even do an A-B test if you want to see if does this UI represent and chunk this out much better than just simply laying this out? Or should we do a different kind of UI? Does this language help these people out? Should we just remove the links and convert it to a button? So content-driven UX says, here's some really great content. This is pivotal for Drupal to get their CMS downloaded. 
but how do we make it more content driven? How do we look at all those different things, those different criteria that we had up there, front loading, chunking, the interaction piece of it, um, how do we make sure that all those are represented just on that page alone? Great. The other one that we had on here before, I am a huge fan of non-competing non um, actions. You know, I find it very remiss a lot of times when you go onto a website and you've got like three CTA buttons right next to each other. You know, you're asking, a, instead of you coming from the place of power and saying, this is what I think you need to click on, it's most important. Now you're leaving it up to the user who's in knowledge base, right? They're learning. Now you're leaving it up to the user to self-define what the next best path is. So you, if you think about a user journey, you've got always at the end of it is the goal, what needs to be, be accomplished at the end of the day. So the place of power says, I'm going to limit that call to action maybe just to one or two items instead of putting millions of things side by side and hoping you know, to whoever that they actually click on the right one that meets the goal faster. So now they're starting to go all in zigzags and stuff because they have to eventually at some point get back on that route. Great. So hopefully that gives you a, some sort of sense of how this framework, how these criteria might get applied in a real, real page, in a real world, world scenario. Now we have uh, six, six minutes left. So we're going to quickly move on to the next thing. Yep. Sure. I think maybe it would make a mobile dev's life easier, but I would still challenge and say that there are certainly mobile UIs that can help to break this up a bit more. So they don't really have a call to action on that page either. You know, the, like the, the, the most dominant one was where we are, New Orleans on a get started page. Great. So we ha we had a we had a group activity plan, but I think we're I think we're good to uh, sort of move into the, the questions at this point because we've got about uh, five minutes to go. So yeah, uh, questions, comments, thoughts. Yep, at the back. You have to think about it as, as, as collaborative, right? You're, the assumption is that you're the expert, right? You are the one that's providing that solution. So in, if, if that was my client, if I was in a situation like that, I would show them how it's done the right way. It, I would make it my job to craft that content, that copy, give them a benchmark, a platform to work from. And then in the content strategy world, you've got so many different things that you can help and arm the client thereafter a web editorial style guide. This is how you continue to write and continue that brand voice and that active you know, voice and all of that stuff. So as a practitioner, I do believe you know, it should be your job to, to blaze that trail. And then the other part of that is to make sure that you help empower your client and make sure they have the tools that they need. You know, all, a lot of times I end up giving my clients two important deliverables. I end up giving them a web editorial style guide. This says how your copy and everything should be you know, written on your site. This is, and it shares web writing best practices so people know about front loading and, and, and chunking and all of that. And then the other piece is you know, that, that optimization piece. So they'll get some sort of like keyword matrix, right? So they can meet that technical side in the back. But you know, that would be kind of the surface, the easy, easy one that I can give to a client, kind of depending on scope. You might need to come up with some other things that will help them to do their job much easier after you hand over the site. But um, again, I would blaze that trail for them and, and show them how it's done, because they're coming to you to learn. Great. There's a question right at the very back there. Yeah, so... And maybe if we could uh, repeat the question to you, because I guess this will be recorded. <laughs> Just to make sure everybody can hear that. So the question was, she heard, she heard one of the only scientific tools that was mentioned was Google Analytics. So she was wondering what other tools that we use to deploy on a website when we're doing the audit piece. So it really kind of depends. A lot of times people are interested in the SEO component. So when it's an SEO type, or just really, I guess, any type, 
I ended up deploying a tool that's called Raven Tools. I would advise you guys to go look it up. It's really awesome. Um, the deliverable there puts you in a place to look really professional. You can, guide, you can give your client a link and it just breaks it down in a really nice report. The other one that I end up doing is SEM Rush. Um, that's a really great tool. Or Content Insights is really nice too. Um, all these tools you can just deploy on a site. It'll go and crawl every single page. Every tool will give you something a little bit different every time. So I do deploy multiple tools on multiple sites. I take what I need so it matches scope, but I also take what I need to help me get over this hump and, and deliver the right solution. And I always, always, always do a manual audit if and when I can. Um, I, so I shouldn't say always, but I always try to do a manual audit as well. It forces me as the practitioner to get face to face with their content. You know, tech is tech, it's not, something's always gonna happen. Um, same thing with human error, but I do believe that, that folks should be getting more, you know, face to face with their own content through a, um, a hybrid. So deploy tools, do, you know, Raven, um, do FCM Rush or Content Insights, um, and then do a little bit of manual auditing yourself. Yes, a question here. So, you know, if it's something like that, so the, okay, so, good. Um, so the question was, what do you do about slang terms or competing terms like Obamacare or Affordable Care, Care Act, right? Um, the assumption there for something that new is you're not going to have a lot of data that like you can even just go into Google keywords and say like, oh, I'll just use the one that like ranks the highest, right? You don't want to miss one market because now you're choosing to go Obamacare and you're going to miss out on all these people who are going Affordable Care Act. So as a content strategist, how do you take both of them? How do you weave it in throughout the site without over uh, keyword stuffing, right? We all, I don't know if you guys know about Google Penguin. Um, but you want to make sure that you use both of them. Slang is really important as long as that slang is universal to that market and to that industry. If it's just a few one-off people doing it, well, you know, you need to go where the majority is. You need to find out which metrics, what's performing well. So if Obamacare happens to perform better than the Affordable Care Act, for me, that would be my front runner, right? I would use that word more. But I don't want to, I don't want to miss any opportunity to capture the people who are going onto Google or Bing and typing in Affordable Care Act. I still need to have that somewhere. So, and then you have to be mindful if you're going to use multiple keywords like that, that you don't get into keyword stuffing or anything like that. And a lot of times you can take those kinds of instances, you know, you might have Affordable Care Act, you know, represented in a great image, right? And so you just title tag the back of it and you've got your juice right there without just overusing it like crazy throughout your copy on site. Great. And I know that's uh, lunch. So obviously... If you, uh, if you want to have lunch, I assume that you probably do want to have lunch. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. And if you want to stick around, uh, we're certainly happy to, to talk a little more shop. We'll probably eat lunch at some point, too. Thanks, everybody.